Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, it's my first time in Yonkers, and I think probably our children's first time in New York. So this is quite an experience for us being African bush people, um, but the Lord has brought us to a totally different environment. What do you do without Google Maps? Uh, however, we'd have found our way here without such technology, I'm not sure. Um, before we share something about what God is doing in Zambia, I'd just like to give some encouragement. I think we all need daily encouragement from the Word of God, and we have the greatest resource for our encouragement, and it is God's love letter to you and me. This is an individually inspired book. God brings it to every one of us to be our guide, our help in everything. And if you don't know anything about Scripture, let me just tell you, this is amazing. Read it for yourself. Don't listen to what I'm saying to you. The Scripture itself gives witness and says, taste and see that the Lord is gracious. You try it for yourself. There are so many voices out there that are bombarding us through technology and everything. And God is saying, here is everything you need if you will simply take and read it. Let it speak for yourself. Don't listen to me today. Um, this has always been the best-selling book over history, translated into more languages than any other book, and yet written in an incredible way by over 35 different people through those 1,500 years, and yet it gives us one message. I know people love to try and criticize it and tear it apart, but I would suggest to you today, if you come to this living, inspired Word of God with an open mind, and that can be hard, as you read it, right from Genesis, 66 books telling you of how this world began through to its completion, your handbook for life and mine in every circumstance that we pass through, God says, I will never leave you. And I will never forsake you. There is no one like him. And once you come to know him, you will be filled with that incredible joy and blessing and satisfaction that nothing else can give. I want to take you to the last book in the Bible, just for a few verses today by way of encouragement. And for those who know, it's the book of the Revelation. And it's really the main prophetical book in the New Testament. And this is the closing of God's revelation, God speaking to you and to me. And so I want to read chapter one and verse number one, just the very first verse of the book of Revelation, and then very quickly take us into chapter four. And the Bible reads, and it says this in Revelation chapter one and verse one, the revelation of Jesus Christ that is fundamental, who is central to this last writing in God's divine record. It is Jesus Christ, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must soon or shortly take place. I just want to draw out of that two quick thoughts. Just as Christ is everywhere in Scripture, because He is the living Word, He is the written Word, and as you open this, you see Him for who He is, and you hear Him for who He is, he is the final part of this divine revelation. Because that is the joy of God's heart, to share his son with you and me. He always gives you the best. And if you are just willing to receive that today, the greatest he can give to any individual is his own son, Jesus Christ. And he did that in an incomparably way at the cross through his death for you and me. And here he says, I'm going to finish my divine writing to you by telling you about my son. Not now as he was in the past, 
not just now as he is in the present, but how he will be in the future. And you and I look at the future of our world today, and there are so many questions and doubts and concerns. Let us remember, Jesus Christ holds the future. And he will bring everything in this universe to a completion in accordance with God's will and purpose. The government of this world doesn't rest upon the European leaders or the Russian leaders or the Chinese leaders or the American leaders. Let us remember the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord and he turns it wherever he wants. The key lesson here, wherever you are reading in this inspired book, look for who? Look for Jesus Christ. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ. I don't have time. He's been presented in so many glorious ways in the previous books. But now this is the final complete revelation of Jesus Christ. And as you read through this book, yes, in its complexity, yes, about future events, don't miss this one overriding point. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. And he alone has the answer to every situation. I can't go into the detail. Chapter 5, he will take a scroll from the hand of the one who's sitting upon the throne, as he alone is worthy to open that scroll. And he presents to heaven itself God's final purpose for this world. And in chapter 8, there's silence in heaven when they see for the first time the angelic coast, the wonder of God's divine plan to bring this broken world to a completion where Christ will reign for a thousand years and complete everything. And it's only Jesus Christ who can work out that purpose and plan of God. Dear friend today, he is the only one who can work out God's plan and purpose for your life today. There is no other. And we see it in this book. Secondly, we're told in this first verse, he's going to tell us about what? Things that are soon going to happen. You see, we are in a very fundamental time period. When this whole world is in chaos, looking for answers, and there is only one who has the answer, because he, the same one, is the creator and sustainer of this universe, but above and beyond that, he is the savior and redeemer of this universe. He is the only one who could transform my broken life. And he is the only one who can make you, in the same way, a new creation. It is Jesus Christ. There are things that are soon going to take place. Dear friends, we have stepped into a new year. And who knows how much closer we are to those things that are soon going to take place. And I emphasize again, that does not rest upon the wisdom of this world's leaders. It rests completely in the hands of our all-wise and incredibly glorious Savior, Jesus Christ. Because in him, as we thought this morning, are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And be assured of this, whatever he begins, he will always complete. He is not only the start, he is the finish. He's not only the alpha, he is the omega. He's not only the first, he is the last. And everything is under his control. Without getting technical for those who belong to Jesus Christ, verse number 19 of chapter 1 divides this book for us into three sections. And I just want to touch that very quickly because this book is so often misunderstood, misinterpreted today. Many tell us as so-called prophets, 666 is here already or whatever it may be. Please, we have the key right here in the divine record record. Chapter 1 verse 19 says this, a divine instruction from Jesus Christ to John the writer, and he says this, write the things which you have seen, section number one. 
Secondly, the things which are, they're taking place now, section number two. And then lastly, he says, and the things which will take place after this, very clearly, section number three. I trust we can all see that. And as we apply those three sections of this book, what did John see first? That is the record of chapter one. He no longer sees Christ in his humiliation nailed to a cross. Take time to read that chapter. He sees a glorified, exalted Jesus Christ. And when he sees him, he falls in fear at his feet as though he was dead. You see, let's get a right understanding of who Jesus Christ is. We praise him for his incredible humility, his descent into this world. But let us not forget that he has been made both Lord and Christ. And John writes to us what he saw first in chapter 1. We have then the things that are taking place now. And you ask yourself, what is God's primary work and function in this world today? It's not in the kingdoms of this world. It's not in the wisdom of this world. God is building another kingdom with far greater wisdom and ability. He is building his church. And he said, the gates of hell will never prevail against it. On this rock, I will build my church. And no matter how chaotic our world becomes, Christ is building his church. And so in chapter 2 and chapter 3, you have seven local churches representing the one unified, glorious church, universal church. And Jesus Christ, in his work today, is walking in the midst of those seven churches. He sees everything. He knows every detail. He brings encouragement. But most of all, he brings correction. Because one day, every one of us in this local church will stand before no other on that day of accountability. It will be Jesus Christ. And I find this incredibly gracious before I stand before him, for him to review my life. In amazing grace, he says, yes, this is good. But this needs to be corrected. And make sure it is corrected now so that you will be amongst the overcomers in that day of accountability at the judgment seat of Christ. The third section, let's come to chapter four. We've had section one, what, Christ, what John saw, section two and three, the seven churches, what Christ is doing now. But then chapter 4, verse 1 says this, after these things, after what things? That time period, that era of the church, after these things, yes, God has something still yet to do. Building his church is an incredible work of God that will stand for all eternity. But then after these things... God has another program to complete in this world. And I can't go into that, but let me just continue. After these things, can I stop and say, what is your future? What is coming for you and me after these things in our lives? What is coming for you and me after this life? I would love to chat with you, but I'm firmly convinced this is not all there is. This physical passing temporary universe is just the stepping stone to eternity. And I ask you today, what is after this for you? And you will only find peace and a solid foundation for your eternity in this same one, Jesus Christ himself. After these things, I looked, and behold, a door was standing open in heaven. What a beautiful picture. 
And then the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, come up here and I will show you things which must take place after this. Verse number two, immediately I was in the spirit and behold a throne set, fi sorry, set, fixed eternally in heaven and one was seated on the throne. Trust God will bless his word to us this morning. John says, I looked. Whether we realize it or not, what we look at in life is so important. Because what we see often determines how we think and so is expressed in who we are. And so we shouldn't be surprised in our world today. We are bombarded with so much to look at, and especially in this technological age of internet, etc. So I simply ask the question, what am I looking at? What is the focus of your life? Without going into details, let's just look very quickly for John. What was he looking at? You see, he's had a life-transforming experience meeting Emmanuel, God with us face-to-face -face in this world, and that transformed his life completely. And he is now focused completely, not on the things of time and sense, but on the things of eternity, heaven itself. You see, when you get a glimpse of who Christ is, you lose that so-called attraction of this world. It's no longer important because you've seen Jesus Christ for who he is. And even though Christ is now ascended into glory, John's focus is now on the things of heaven. And dear Christian friend, if we look around us, we will become disappointed we will become confused. And so often, when we look inside us, we may be distressed. But if we look up to heaven, we will be delighted. Keep our focus upon Christ. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Very quickly, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 18 says this, we do not look at what is seen. This is speaking about Christians who've had that transforming experience in their life when the light of the glorious gospel of Christ shined into their darkened hearts and made them a new creation, and they received their spiritual sight. And so the writer says, we don't look at what is seen. We look at what is unseen, because the things that are seen are temporary, passing, but the things that are unseen are eternal. What is he speaking about? How can you look at something that cannot be seen? Before I knew Christ, there were so many things I could not see because I was dependent upon my physical eyesight, my physical ability to understand. But when I came to know Jesus Christ, he gave me a new set of eyes, a different eyesight, a spiritual vision, where I started to see not the things of this physical world, but the things that are eternal. And you see, this is John. Can I just introduce you to who he is and where he is? He has been a committed follower of Jesus Christ for so many years, and now at the end of his life, here he is banished on the Isle of Patmos for his faith in God. And you would say, Christian life is so pointless and worthless. Look at John. Look at where he is. Yes, that's from the worldly perspective. That's with your physical eyesight. But where is he? He may be abandoned by the Roman government. He may have been punished for the rest of his life, finishing his life in isolation on that island. But you see, that's just the physical side. 
the spiritualized side is this. He sees heaven opened. He has a totally different view on life. And it doesn't matter what experience you and I may be passing through today. There is one fact that is certain and secure. When you belong to Jesus Christ, heaven's door is always open for you. The very throne room of God, the very presence of the God of eternity is available for you and I at any point in our lives. He saw heaven's door opened. Can I just bring a quick contrast? Um, at the end of chapter 3, you find another door. Chapter 3, verse 20, speaking to the final church of Laodicea that has almost put Christ outside of the church. He appeals to individuals. And please, when you come into churches today, don't assume everyone in that church is a true follower of Jesus Christ. There must be the appeal to the individual. And Christ says, I'm standing at the door and I'm knocking. And we so often take that simply to be the very door of my heart. Access to my life, to the throne room of my life. And Christ is there knocking. The King of all kings, the Lord of all lords, he died to redeem and save me. Yet one point in my life, he came to knock in absolute incredible mercy, love, and grace. You live in New York. How many thieves come to knock at the door? <laughs> Someone who knocks at the door is genuine. Someone who knocks at the door is coming the right way. Someone who knocks at the door has the right interest in your life, wanting a word with you about something. This one who's knocking at your door wants to discuss with you and me the most important topic there ever could be, how I can be set free from Satan's slavery and set free from Adam's sinful nature in all its control in my life. And there is only one way. He became my kinsman redeemer to set me free. And now that work is over. He comes to knock and appeal individually to every person in this universe today. If only you will hear my voice and open the door. Perhaps there's someone here today you've never personally heard his voice. But he is calling. He not only calls from the witness of creation, the heavens declare the glory of God. I was without excuse, even though I may never have read the word of God, based upon his revelation in creation, I was without excuse. I would justly and righteously stand before him on that day of judgment because he revealed his divine power and nature in what he created. Have we heard that voice? How many years have we lived in this world? That's not in my ability. That's due to the care of an incredible God who's not only our creator, but he's there to look after and provide for everything. He has created the oxygen you breathe, it's all free. The water you drink, it's all free. Everything from God of value is free for you and me today. He speaks in your conscience. Listen to that inner voice that is resident in every human being. And yes, he does speak through this book. But most of all, most glorious of all, he speaks at the cross. Oh, the depth of his love. Oh, the suffering he willingly endured so that he, the son of God, would love me and give himself for me. He says, if you'll just hear my voice, he is calling. And he's calling for anyone today, come to me if you're weary, if you're carrying heavy burdens that are there because of the sinful nature in your life. He says, come to me, I have been burdened. I've carried that load for you already at the cross. You come. 
and I will give you rest. It's a promise, and he's knocking. What do I learn from that? Anyone who opens the door of their heart, the door of their life here in this temporary world, one day, every one of them, Christ will open heaven's door and receive them into heaven itself on heaven's shore. It's that certain and that secure. What does this mean for me today? For John, this was an incredible uplift during his time of suffering. And dear friend, if you are suffering in your life, yes, God does know about it. And just to confirm that, he suffered far more than I will ever suffer. He willingly became a human being in this broken world of sin, and then finally not only suffering in a broken world as the divine Son of God at the cross itself, but beyond that, not only to save us, but to be an incredible, faithful high priest, one who comes alongside to lift you up during your time of struggle and suffering in this world because he has suffered already far more than you and I could never suffer. For John, this was an incredible uplift. But can I encourage you and I today? Heaven's door is always open. Hebrews 4, Hebrews 10, read the passages to come boldly to the throne of grace without fear so that we may obtain mercy. We need that and find grace to help in time of need. Someone put it like this, at times in my life, God may be merciful and relieve the burden that I'm carrying. In other times, he may be gracious and give me the strength to carry on taking that burden, but he is always there. Can I lift it to another dimension? In some ways here, at the end of the age of the church, stepping into something further, greater, from chapter 4 to chapter 22, everything that will take place in the future, perhaps in picture form. We have a beautiful scene depicting to you and me that time when Jesus will come. And he will step out of heaven again and descend to the clouds to call out of this world every blood-bought child of God still alive in this world. Because, dear friend, there is one thing I am looking for and waiting for any moment. At the end of this book, three times over, Jesus Christ says, truly, I am coming soon. And he could come today. What a beautiful thought. Heaven's door could open for you and I today, and every one of us caught up out of this world, transformed into his image and glory, joined by those who've gone before their bodies resurrected and transformed, and together he takes us all, one complete church, into heaven itself to be with him for all eternity. What a wonderful prospect. Heaven's door will open. I leave for your thought, go through scripture in terms of heaven opened. We had one this morning from our brother in Mark chapter one. And the voice that came proclaiming who Jesus Christ is. So we have no doubt. Don't listen to any other. Don't listen to human beings. Listen to the voice from God. He says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. In Acts chapter 7, at the end of that chapter, heaven is opened again for Stephen, stoned to death, so wrong, so cruel, such hatred. And sadly, that's often how people of God have died in this world. And yet Stephen isn't looking at his persecutors. He's looking into heaven itself, and he says, I see heaven opened, and Jesus standing. You see, perhaps I may not be alive 
when Jesus Christ returns. But if today is my day to leave this world, it will be just the same. And Jesus Christ, my Savior and Lord, will personally open heaven's door for me and welcome me onto heaven's shore. What a wonder and a privilege. Here for John, heaven's door is opened to reveal to him the future events. But then lastly, in chapter 19 of this book, verse 11, heaven's door is opened for the king to return the king of all kings and the lord of all lords, riding upon the white horse, not now coming in mercy and grace, bringing peace and salvation, but coming in war and righteousness to judge and to establish his kingdom that will take place. He says, let me introduce to you, apologies, time has already gone. Let me introduce to you, he says, things that are going to take place soon. And how soon they are, God alone knows. But let's be ready and let's be prepared. Only one life. Only one life to live. Only what's done for Christ will last. Can I close with verse 2 very quickly and enjoy the rest of this beautiful chapter introducing us to heaven? The first thing that John sees as he enters heaven's door is what? He sees the throne. You see, we need to get that vision today. God's throne is set, fixed, established in heaven for all eternity. He says, from everlasting to everlasting, I am God. There is no other. And he sits upon his throne. It will never be usurped. It will never be overthrown. God's throne stands fixed and eternal, and he is in absolute control of everything. And secondly, he is always on schedule with his program. You may think things are out of control. No, they are not. God is still waiting in incredible grace, not wanting anyone to perish. And even though we're going through a dark time in this world, his light is still shining. But this is so fundamental when we enter this third section of the book. Because we must know, even though there will be a time of tribulation when God will seemingly hand over the government of this world to Satan and to his henchmen, In reality, it's God who's ruling. And it's God who's on the throne. And all things may take place, but ultimately, the kingdoms of this world, chapter 11, will become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. God is in control. Have we placed him in control of our lives? Does he really sit upon the throne of my heart? Is he truly number one? Is he all that I am seeking for? If he is, he's not just giving you a type of life. He's giving you an abundant life, the very life for which you and I were initially made. Be encouraged today. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ. He's the one we need to see. And to recognize these things will soon take place.